What's up guys, I'm your host Sean Gramer, and this is the Vikings. Wait, that sounded really weird. What's up guys? Let's go! You can't do that on Tyreek Hill. And we decided to do the exact thing that we know we can't do against the Bears, which is on the ball. episode because i cannot get a screen recording started on my computer i'm gonna just react to uh two things that i was gonna wanted to get into one was at donna tell in a recent press conference and two was something i didn't actually realize was the vikings rode to 500 wins so let me get this going sorry hey good afternoon um Really excited for this stop, you know, and part of that is the people sitting out here. I've enjoyed that in every stop, getting to know you. Um, such a storied franchise, um, to learn more about it and, and be part of it. Uh, a lot of people say, well, how did this start, this relationship, where, where I was attracted to this organization? In early talks with Kevin uh, and also with Quasi, it was really easy for me to feel how connected they were and aligned they were. And they had a vision. This is a vision of growth, a collaboration, you know, growing new people, growing leaders. And I want to be part of that. And I, I see myself as a team builder. And to jump on with somebody that's young and progressive, uh, with, that are on the top cutting edge of things, was really attractive to me. Another thing is, is you look at the Wilf family and how they had demonstrated to the National Football League that they're going to be first class in everything. You look at our stadium, you know, state of the art. This training facility is second to none. And they'll, they have the resources to help you do everything you possibly can to win. Yeah, literally the one stadium I think actually looks cooler than The Viking tradition. Yes, bank is you know, you grow up as a young kid, but it's also a college kid. College this is special. Theater. I've been in this so. league a long time, and to have the opportunity to be part of this, this fan base. They're, they're wonderful. You know, they're respected. Uh, you know they're going to come out and make it hard on that quarterback every week with you. And I just love this community and how they support football. The, the tradition of Bud Grant, I hope I can meet him. I met Paul. I, I connected with Paul Wiggin again in the hallway today. It's those kind of guys with the tradition and the Bud Grant with his timeless wisdom. If I can tap into him because he's still got it. And every, I've met him before. Um, one message is to the players. You know, we got a lot of work to do, but nobody's going to have more fun doing it. You know, we're going to have a good time. We're hiring a staff of teachers, positive teachers. And these guys are going to, they're, they're also uh, guys that will grow young men, not just teach the scheme, but it's going to be a positive nature. We're going to have a great time. And these relationships will be very important to our success. You ask about the scheme that, that we're, we're going to implement in here. And uh, it's going to be a multiple dictating 3-4 and 4-3 setup. So just know that we'll have both fronts. Um, and that will, that will make us hard to play against. Everything else we do will be engineered to make it hard for the quarterback. That's physically and mentally. You know, Keystone uh, foundation points, you know, we're going to set edges, okay? That, that's our, our outside linebackers, defensive end. They're gonna, we're going to set hard edges. We're going to be a great tackling outfit. Um, you, you look at our history as coaches, uh, takeaways is, is, is a foundation point. That, that has to happen. And that has to be an edge for this team. You get the ball for our offense so they can get into uh, scoring position and score points so we can win. So. With that, I'd just like to open it to any questions you might have. What did you see? Did you look at a lot of tape of the Vikings? They had a lot of trouble in the last couple minutes of halves or games. Have you had a chance to look through that and say, this is what needs to change? No, I haven't, I haven't got to that. Uh, but we'll address all problems. That's a very important one. It's a fair question. You know, you want to win the middle eight of a game at half, and you want to, you know, you want to be at your best at the end as well. At this point, do you have any uh, idea how you, how you will use Daniil Hunter? Yeah, he, he would be an outside linebacker, defensive end. Yes. We can do both. What's that? We can do both. Oh, yeah. 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 And, you know, uh, 
I think Kevin mentioned this, you know, very much of the, the, the downs will be playing in this league because of the multiple receivers. There's going to be in a lot of nickel. And in the nickel, we'll play an even front and an odd front. So that won't be much change. There'll be a lot of carryover to, to our guys. So, um, you know, ch change, when, when, when change happens, there's a lot of uncertainty, uncertainty. And some people are uncomfortable with change. But we welcome that. That's a good thing, you know. That, that's opportunity. And uh, we don't know where we're going right now exactly. There's so much that our staff and myself has to do to learn our players, to learn our talents, to learn their minds. So, you know, our emphasis right now is pouring into learning our people. And when you learn your people, you can take them somewhere. And that's what our intention is. As a, uh, as a savvy veteran that's been around the league a long time, uh, how, how do you keep fresh that you can communicate with the younger people and, and, and how do you stay nimble that you don't go back to your kind of old ways? Yeah, fair question. I love it. You know, that's what I am. I'm going to be like this till I'm done. And I'm on a, I'm on a five-year plan, you know, so five years from now. And then next year will be five more. So, so you just figure it out that way. So uh, you got to work at it because there's more layers when you, when, you, when you get up there in age. A little bit, and if you can combine staying current and using your experience, then you got something, and that's my intention. So what I do, I, I listen to young people, and I and I seek and I put energy into learning them. Uh, my sons are coaches, and they're at a younger age, and they played, and I, I, I ask them a lot of things because the, the views have changed, and uh, people that get up here and say, well. Uh, these kids have changed, and this and that. Um, it, 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 people have always been changing, you know, since the beginning of time. And it's our job as leaders to uh, work to relate. You've got players who have been in a 4-3 scheme, and you talk about going to multiple fronts. What's the biggest thing you have to teach players who have maybe not played in that type of a scheme before? Yeah. Great question. There's always adjustment. And if you look at uh, just in the 3-4, with uh, one of my, my great partner, Vic Fangio. We rolled into San Francisco about 11 years, 12 years ago, and we did a four-year stint there. And they already had some 3-4 setup going there. And we rolled into Chicago, and their defense had started to decline, and they were 4-3. So there was a, a major change there. Um, so we did that exercise, and then we, we rolled into Denver four years later. So it helps to have been through the drill a couple times. Uh, the only thing I want to do different here is do it better. You know, you should get better at things if you've had a couple, you know, runs through it. So uh, I don't know if I answered your question. Uh, uh, what did I fear? I don't fear anything, you know. Uh, I want to put all my experience together to fix it and get it right. One thing you hear about some of the Fangio style defenses that Staley ran um, is the phrase gap and a half when it comes to that front. What does that mean? Uh, good question. Uh, uh, it, you know, it means we're going to hit blocks thick, okay? We have big, strong bodies inside, and then we're going to get off blocks, so you might be playing your gap and a half. Uh, that, and then it relates to linebackers. They're going to be, you know, stacking a gap, falling back, so we, we get overlap. This thing is about overlap. And then there's this, the next level. You know, our guys will be coming down from a shell alignment, and they're that third layer of overlap, a safety or a corner. So that's kind of where that speaks to. And, uh, you know, we want to have overlap so we can make it harder for the quarterback to see what's really going on when they snap it. And what, what is it about Kevin's? Uh, you talk about young and progressive, yeah. one, working with these younger coaches. Uh, what is it specifically about him, his young and progressive approach that, that you like? Uh, I, I, I just connected with it, you know, and I, that's the way I stay young. I have to be around young open, progressive, new ideas. Um, I welcome the science of the NFL. You know, uh, we use this term analytics. We need both. You know, it's not this. It's this that makes that work. The idea of a lot of players that have played together for a long time on defense, you know, Anthony Barr, Eric Hendricks, uh, Harrison Smith, will they be allowed to have their input even though you're, you're doing different schemes? Is that your coaching style to like listen to what they have to say also and, and move forward that way? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. You know, how can you be the best if you're not tapping into people and getting their views? And I want to grow their views. You know, if we grow them, even though they're veteran players in certain areas, then they can give you back more. 
But that's, that's really the secret. That's the secret to a coaching staff. You know, we have a new coaching staff. I haven't coached with any of them. But bringing them together and learning them and learning their strengths and us, you know, working off each other, that, that's how it works. So answer to a short question is absolutely. Now, we are the coaches and we are the leaders and there are parameters. But, uh, but when it flows and they create something that you haven't seen before, that, that's really powerful. You mentioned learning the personnel and, and the players you have in the building. Who excites you about this defense? What excites me? Who? You know, I, I don't want to get into names. You guys know the, the, uh, you know the core guys are here, and then some guys aren't under contract. And if I left somebody's name out, you know, I wouldn't want to do that. You know, we, we think all these guys are a potential starter or a potential star, and our thing is to connect with them and then see how far we can take them. Michael, Michael Pierce. You were 25th in 2020, and then moved up to third in defense last year. How did you orchestrate that turnover? Yeah. In, in, in points, in, in points again. Short memory. Go ahead. But, um, but does that give you optimism that you can orchestrate a similar turnaround here? And, I, and what were the keys to that turnaround? Yeah. First of all, yes, we are confident that we can. Um, but, you know, we're just on a journey. It just started. And it's going to be different than the last journey. But when you've done it a few times, I, I, I'm confident of that. And I know some of the, you know, there'll be setbacks along the way, you know, and you may have to tweak things. Uh, so forth, but yeah, we're very confident in our, in our you know, in our, our path shows that we've been able to do that. Now we got to prove it, and that's that's the fun, right? Coach, you talked about having a lot of work to do, but having fun while doing yeah. it and incorporating positivity. I guess, how much do you believe that that culture and that locker room chemistry leads to, or at least contributes to, success on the field? Yeah, two things. One, you, you should have some fun. Why wouldn't you do that? You know, if you can coach in this great league, have fun and have this great lifestyle, what, what, you know, that, that's the ultimate. And I choose to have both, to be able to be part of success and have a, a good time. What was the other part of that question? Oh, just how much um, culture oh, and yeah, chemistry yeah. leads to success. That's really the thing that Kevin and Quasi and all of our coaching staff is trying to do, okay? And there, we want a cultural advantage. We want a culture where a guy puts on a Viking uniform, he just plays better where he comes from. We want a culture where guys want to come here, all right, with thriving culture. But culture means everything. Everybody says, hey, you know, this guy's over here. He plays this, this uh, technique, this position. Do your job. It's not just that. It's the environment and the community. Everybody, the jobs you have, how, how important is the community and the friends you have and the relations you, relationships you have to your success? Right, it's big. Everybody in here can feel it. You you can tell when you've had a job where you, you know, are excited to turn your car in there and go to work and see your colleagues. And there's other times where hey, this this is going to be a drag today. So we want to create that. Um, it takes a lot of effort. It's not easy. It has to be nurtured and nurtured. And when I you have it, you still have to nurture like it. To be an Coach, and what, what's one way that's maybe most obvious to you about how the scheme is running now? Is Different than like 20 years ago when you're with Green Bay or whatever. Scheme? Yeah. Um, well, like I said, I was a 4-3 coach for, you know, half of this and 3-4. Uh, it's more like how the, the offense, you know, they're the guys changing us, you know, because we're defense. And that's the evolution there. That's where it's changed, you know, the quarterback and the gun, the RPOs, you know, the – you know, the, the, our, our, I got to back up. When you play against um, Wes's offense here, that'll, that'll battle test us. You know, they have so many problem sets in there that you got to work through that, that uh, I have on my mind, but that'll have us ready to play. You know, they play with tempo. They play, they change the width. They uh, just multiple pass combinations that are cutting edge. So, so that's, that's how it's changed. They've changed us, you know. You got a background with defensive backs. What do uh, DBs need to do well in, in your defense to make things hard on on the offense? Yeah, great question. You know, uh, we want guys to have multiple talents. You know, and first of all, we want them to have b ball skills. Okay, we want to be able to cover man to man. If we're talking corner or safeties, uh, we'll, we'll have safeties that are interchangeable. And like the safeties are playing here now, they can be down in the box and also in the deep part of the field. But uh, ultimately, it's the, it's the unit working together. When you can get corners outside, 
that can cover man to man, that's a, that's a great asset to you. Yeah, how much have you talked to Mike Hedden, and how do you anticipate you all working together on yeah, the defense? Very good. You know, uh, Mike is a you know a long time um, you know colleague in the business. I never worked with him. Got great respect for him. He, he's uh, going to be the assistant head coach and help, but but he's a huge resource. You know, anytime you can bounce things off a guy that's been in your shoes, um, that brings a wealth of knowledge. You know, we and we'll use him where we need him. You know, I mean, he's he's so flexible, uh, but a uh, great asset in the game planning. He'll be around for that. Thanks, Israel. Okay. Thank you. Oh, finally, here it is. Article today. What is it? The Vikings. The Vikings' 500th regular season victory in franchise history appeared to be in the bag. Until it wasn't. Until the mass. But the massive milestone. Oh yeah. But the massive milestone occurred on week 11 of the 2021 season against the Packers. Greg Joseph capped the border battle off with a walk-off field goal for a 34-31 win. 500 is a heck of a number, said Hall of Fame guard Randall McGowan. The Vikings hit the mark in their 61st season and 928th regular season game, with Minnesota's all-time record now stands at 503 at 421-1 in the last season. The Vikings became the 15th franchise in league history to register 500 wins. I think that's a, a long way now. We just have to wait and see what happens. I know there are a lot. There are a lo there were quite a few teams that joined the from 1960 to 1961. The Broncos, the Cowboys, the Patriots, not the Steelers. The Vikings became the 01 team. Minnesota is the fourth franchise that began play in 1960 or later to record 500 regular season victories, joining New England, Dallas, and the Kansas City three teams that have all done it with the Vikings. Minnesota's all-time win percentage of 545 is the seventh best among current 32 NFL teams. We weren't one of the founding teams in the NFL, so we got a little start on the 500 wins Hall of Fame wide receiver Chris Carter said. I think when we look back at the 101 yards, 101 years of the NFL and look at the Vikings' history, we've been hanging in there for a long time, too. Look at any decade, we've been very competitive for that, Carter added. 500. Welcome to a special edition of Skull Stories. I'm Viking team reporter Eric Smith. 500 win. Welcome to a special edition of Skull Stories. I'm Viking team reporter Eric Smith. 500 wins. The Vikings in victory. Vikings hit their 500th all-time regular season win in week 11 of the 2021 season. It was a thrilling 34. Welcome to a special edition of Skull Stories. I'm Viking. And make no, and make no mistake about it. The compilation of wins over the decades has been a true team effort. It's a collective effort from everyone since the organization's inception. It goes back and forth and forth and forth and forth. It's kind of a tribute to everybody that has come before us. Coaches, players, front office, everybody. It's a big win for everyone involved. Viking linebacker Scott Studwell added all the dedication, the work ethic, the commitment from top to bottom, whether it's ownership to the equipment people to the maintenance people that took care of the facility. A lot of times we get a lot more credit than maybe we deserve as players. There's no much, there's so much sacrifice that goes on. Anyone that has worked for the Vikings understands that. But everyone has a favorite win, right? One that had a crazy ending, one that meant something to someone's own personal career, or one that helped cap off a successful season. For the past six months, Vikings.com recapped the legendary figure from across franchise history and found the victory that meant the most to them. That's like trying to find a needle in a haystack, said former Vikings.
Like he's kind of very cult like to me. Here are fifteen stories from their pa- from past to present that tells the story of the Vikings of the late five hundred years. Number one, Fran Pilsenbrink. September seventeenth, nineteen sixty one, week one, where we crushed the Bears. At least that at least that's what Fran told. We actually start from the beginning, of course. At least that's what Fran Pilsenbrink did, as we were told the thirty seven to thirteen stunner. I can go back to the very first game. I think we won of all time, Pilsenbrink said. We were playing the Chicago Bears. We were a new franchise, and a new franchise had ev- no fr- no new franchise had ever won anything. The day was September 17, 1961. More than 30,000 spectators packed in that stadium for the first regular season game in Viking history. The home team wasn't favored, especially after an uninspiring exhibition schedule that included five losses and five wins. One of those came against the Bears, who claimed a 30-7 to win at Kingston Stadium in favor of the Diablo in early September. And the Bears, well, the Bears were well the Bears, a historically revered franchise led by legendary Stuart Powell. Hoggington, who had become the third drafted player by Minnesota in the previous December, explained the vibe going into the franchise opener. We were 28-point underdogs. Two weeks before, we had lost to the Bears in Iowa. Parkinson said, "So we had no choice. We, so we had no chance to beat the King of the Kings, Stuart Powell, the founder of the National Football League, the general manager, and head coach of the Bears. We won everything we could and could do. We won everything we could and could do." Parkinson didn't start the game because head coach Norm Van Brocken opted for veteran George Shaw over the rookie quarterback. Van Brocken switched to Parkinson for the, in the first quarter, though, despite the Vikings holding a three-zero lead. The twenty twenty the twenty one year old sparked the Vikings to an explosive offensive performance where Parkinson accounted for five total scores, four of which came through the air. Hayden or McKay, I happened to complete seventeen passes for two hundred and fifty yards. I threw for four touchdown passes and ran for another. I don't remember much about it, Parkinson said, with a sly smile. How would be able to pick apart such a stout defense? About eighty percent of my calls were audibles, because Van Brocken was a genius offensive mind. Parkinson said, they blitzed all the time, so I pushed the right buttons when they blitzed and who and knew who to throw to, where to throw. We had an incredible day. Parkinson's amazing debut included touchdown passes to Bob Schnelzer, Jerry Reichai, Hugh McElhinney, and Dave Norton. Why do we have to have so many Russian dudes on our team? was simply the opening act for his Pro Football Hall of Fame career, and it ensured the Vikings would always remember their first win in franchise history. I would say this is the greatest upset in the history of the National Football League, Parkinson said. I s- it set the standard for our team for then and later. Bud Grant, uh, October 15, 1967, Vikings. Let me go through some of the similarities. November 12, 1972, week one. Number 12, 1972, week one. Oh. Josh. Oh, that's what the numbers are for. Scott Sidewell, October 2nd, 1977, week two. It just realized what that goes for. Numbers are for. Number 135, Jerry Reichai. September 4th, 1977, week 12. December December 14, 1980, week 13, Greg Coleman. Randall McDaniels, 1980, September 11, 1988, week 2. That's the amount of people there is. Number 228, December 25, 1989, Dennis Brown, week 16. 245, John Randall, September 27, 1982, 1990, week 2. 270, Chris Carter, sep- December 1st, 1994, week 14. That's the day before my 21st birthday. Number 303, Robert Smith, October 5, 1998, week 5. Eighty-four, Eric Sugarman, December 9, 2007, week 14. Dang, there's a lot of people. Okay, 
413 of the Rogers, Rogers Institute, December 28, 2010, and reached 15. I also hear the mess of uncollapsing that became displayed for the rest of the home game as the Rogers Cross Stadium was being laid back and twisted. Number 426, December 30, 2012, Harry the Hitman Smith reached 17. Wow, they just hit some insane shots right there. I want to see a very recent one. Like Brian Roberson, January 3rd, 2016, week 17. We demolished the Bears that game. We d we crushed them. Wait. Never mind, I was thinking about the wrong one. Wait, week 17. I have my favorite one was from 2016 when we ended up clinching the division over Green Bay. Was that when we beat them? Uh, I think that's when, um, well, yeah, so th that's when Anthony Barr knocked down the possibly game winning Hail Mary. We beat the Packers at their, ho at their home at Lambeau. They were 3-3 three and three in their division. They only won away the one game. That's going to be it for the video. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, hit that bell. Comment what we do if you like to see. And as always, don't forget, the Packers really suck. Go Vikings.